All right, welcome back to the Ottawa studios of Inside My Canoe Head. I am your host, Dr. D. Today, we are talking about this incredible need everyone has to be right and our lost ability to understand that sometimes we might actually be wrong. So sit back, grab yourself your favorite beverages. Let's get at her. All right, thanks again for joining us here at Inside My Canoe Head and all of your wonderful notes you keep sending me at www.insidemycanoehead.ca. And welcome to my friends. This is the 299th episode of Inside My Canoe Head since we launched our first episode on 28 April 2020. About four to six weeks into knee deep into lockdowns, pandemic, craziness, idiocy, and everything else that came out of that experience. And Inside Mike and Head was started because there was a clearly demonstrated abject lack of preparedness in the population for dealing with exogenous shocks. Things that come out of left field and punch you upside the head that you did not see coming. The vast majority of the population was unprepared for that event. They needed immediate government intervention to keep going and some for a sustained period of time. So Inside My Canoe Head was created by myself, named by my wonderful daughter-in-law, uh, to do the, just that, to provide rational intelligence, evidence-based preparedness information. So for the next big punch upside the head that we don't know when that's coming or what it'll include, you and your family are going to be ready to navigate it to some greater degree than you were before. And it's free, always will be free. This is our community service. This podcast is grounded in realistic ideas. We don't advocate for a collapse of society. We don't think that the chicken little was correct. The sky's coming down. Societal collapse groups of marauders in the streets and people are going to hunt you down to steal all the preparations that you have made. Um, I'm not trying to run that kind of channel. If I did, I would likely have triple, quadruple, or tenfold greater subscribers and followers. But then I'd have to look at the guy in the mirror at the night, and I think that's a little bit more important. So based upon that, though, what if those people realize that they're not right? What if the apocalyptic prepper type stuff that's on YouTube, they realize, they probably know, but what if they look themselves in the mirror and realize, you know what? irrespective of who wins the U.S. election coming up on the 5th of November, the world's not going to collapse. You may not like the outcome. Fair enough. Good on you. Bad on you. Doesn't matter. Really, nobody really cares what you and I think about the election. The point is, is that it's going to continue on. Society's going to keep churning. The oil's coming out of the ground. The wind turbines are going to turn. The idiocy that happens in, in the media is going to carry on. Like, this is normal which is why we thought it would be really important today to talk about a key issue. And we've been doing some research on this one for a little period of time because we really think part of our issues we have in today's discourse. Now, discourse is the totality of communication. So it's verbal, nonverbal, et cetera. We're missing the ability to understand that we might actually be incorrect, right? So... When you listen, and this is a great lead in, when you listen, are you listening to respond to somebody else or are you listening to understand and learn? See, there's, you know, the old saying is God gave us two ears and one mouth, use them in that order. The idea being is that when somebody is presenting their thoughts and ideas to you, are you framing as you receive this, how am I going to win? How am I going to defeat how am I going to show them that they're wrong and I'm right? Or are you sitting back digesting what they're saying and maybe trying to understand a little bit about what the background is and, and maybe why they're coming to this type of position? This happens a lot in the emergency management debate. And this is why I think it's important for this podcast, not just in general for everybody's life, but because within the emergency management discourse, there's, there's a lot of innovative new ideas. But we have a lot of people who are grounded in a system that hasn't changed in 30 years. 
And the difficulty, and this gets back to something I wrote a couple of years ago on the sunk cost fallacy. Now, the sunk cost fallacy is an economic idea that means at a certain point, you're going to have so much time and resources, so it could be money or just time, invested in an idea, strategy, plan, or way of life that you just won't abandon it because of all of what you've invested into it, right? So you, you've, you know, you've championed this idea of, say, for example, emergency kits save lives. And you've been doing this for 20 years. And then a researcher like me comes along and says to you, in fact, my friend, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that anybody, any single individual's life was saved by an emergency kit. Now, are they necessary? Yeah, absolutely. And I had a fantastic um, entrepreneur on here from uh, Paradise, just outside of Paradise, California, the town that burned down, talks about she has a mama bear kit. I mean, she has some fantastic products. But the idea that it is the one key to get you to success line, people are married to that. And then when you try to challenge that and tell them, hey, listen, an emergency kit may make sense in part of a totality and of emergency preparedness plan. Some people have an exceptional difficulty of realizing that maybe their all in investment in this one idea might be misguided. And I'm being politically correct and, and polite here because the reality is, is they're not stupid. They're not dumb. They're care and invested. It's just at some point we have a difficulty understanding that or accepting that we may be wrong. And really, when I was doing research for this, uh, I came across a fantastic article in Psychology Today, and it's uh, from 19 September 2021. It's entitled The Need to Always Be Right or The Need to Be Always Right Between Pride and Self-Deception. It's written by Iskra Fileva, and I apologize uh, if I uh, mispronounce your name. Uh, she's a PhD in writes in the Philosopher's Diaries, and it's a really, really succinct, clever presentation of the idea and the need to be right. And it's basically grounded in there's a spectrum of reasons why people feel they need to be right. Number one is you believe you, right? You and I, uh, you believe you when you believe something to be true, right? When you believe something to be accurate, you believe you, you believe you have it right. So it's very difficult to challenge the idea that, in fact, you may not have it right. And what you've been saying, writing, and pontificating about might indeed be incorrect. There's also a groupthink um, ideology, and this, this is profound on the internet, right? So if you've ever heard the phrase called an echo chamber... An echo chamber is when you find a group of individuals who think the same way you do. So if I take uh, 10 people who hate Trump and put them in a room, they're going to come out of the room hating Trump more. If I take 10 people who love Trump and put them in a room, they're going to come out of the room loving Trump more. Echo chambers are when people create spaces where they only hear things that agree with their position, right? And we see this often on the internet where... People will just block everybody who has a set of opinions different than them, and they will create an echo chamber. So the only thing that's around them and the only thing they hear are people that support the same idea. So it's confirmation bias. It's reinforcement. It's telling you that you are indeed correct because you're only surrounding yourself by people who say and believe the same thing as you, right? That happens a great deal. We also have an imagined hierarchy in our society. If you think about where is your place in the imagined hierarchy? And, and I have a, if, if you know me when I call myself the monkey or Dr. D, I have a PhD in public policy and a bunch of other degrees, whatever. Some people will take the fact of that higher education is present and place themselves in an imaginary higher period. So in other words, they have more value to society. Their opinions matter more because of this uh, hierarchical achievement that they made, right? Now, sometimes that relationship exists when I'm lecturing in a master's degree in a, in a graduate degree program and I'm talking to my students. There is a professor-student relationship there, but it's not that I'm smarter than them. It's that 
I am presenting an idea and I'm challenging the way they think. But there's a there is a real uh, imaginary hierarchy within society, right? We want ourselves. We want to be seen as positive, right? We want our views to be seen as positive, contributory, valued, needed, and wanted within society and the circles that we have. So we have this imagined need to be valued by the people who listen to or hear our opinions, right? We're not very good at failures, We're not very good at failures. And I talked about this before in a previous episode and a little bit of side thing is we need to champion failure more, right? And, and when I was, when I first went through the military training system, back when I first joined the army in the 90, early nineties, you were, you had the snot kicked out of you for failing, right? Because you were a loser. You couldn't do the simple thing you were asked. That was the kind of attitude. When I went through leadership, senior leadership training, uh, in the mid 2000s, um, it was different. It was like, I expect you to fail and I expect you to fail often, but I expect you to fail forward. And that saying meant that I expect you to be wrong. I expect you to be unsuccessful, but that's why we train. That's why we work. That's why we practice, right? So that you learn from your mistakes. Entrepreneurs know this, and I've been on a personal entrepreneurial journey for about four years now. Uh, my company right now, Preparedness Labs Incorporated, um, owns this podcast, by the way. Um, I'm on my fourth, fourth iteration. The first three didn't work. They were failures. But I learned from iterations of those, pumped more, more of my mo- own money into the company, came back and realized, you know what? I'm learning from that. That iteration didn't work. This iteration that I'm on right now is actually successful. We filed our tax return last year. We owed corporate income tax. Now, some people say that's dumb, never pay tax. But when you pay corporate tax, you're a contributing member of society. And I really think that my society is pretty cool. And as a corporation that makes profit, I think it's a good idea to do that. Okay, that that soapbox aside, but it's the idea that in your head, when you look at that incredible person in the mirror, and think about this for a second, if you fail... How do you frame and view that? How do you frame your own personal failures when you attempt to do something and it's deemed unsuccessful or you didn't reach the standard or you didn't get it? Like, for example, and this was a great newscast and I forget the um, the basketball player, very, very articulate from the NBA. And he was asked about losing. You know, was this year, was this year a loss? And he looked at the guy and... And he said, how many championships does LeBron James have? And he said this to the reporter. And I think the answer was five. I'm not a huge NBA fan. so. But the point of it was, is he said, okay, LeBron James has played 21 seasons. And he's won five titles. Are the other 16 failures? Like, did he fail? You know, and I'm an NHL fan, a diehard NHL fan. I'm a season ticket holder for the Ottawa Senators. They haven't made the playoffs in seven years. Are they failing? Because you know what? There are 32 teams in the league and only one team wins the Stanley Cup every year. So did the 31 other teams really fail? I mean, if the only thing that you do in it is to win the Cup, then, then every year, yeah, 31 teams will fail. But there's a lot more to arbitrary definition than that. But do you, if you just ask yourself that, do you fail and do you fail well? And for some people, and this is a point my brother made uh, last night when we had a quick conversation, and I was just giving him a little chat about this podcast and what we we're going to put on today. And he said, just in his phrase, that sometimes the argument becomes the point, right? The argument itself is the point. I need to win the argument. I don't need to win the truth. I don't need to be correct. I just need to be successful. See, those are two different views of the same thing. We have this inherent need to win. When I sit down and have a de- uh, debate with somebody, and I've had many debates, I love debating people that I disagree with because that's how we learn. We've long lost the ability online. Now it's just name-calling discourse and the ridiculous idiocy of a lack of professional persona that you just call people names and spam them and just 
idiocy. It's like somebody have a petulant child having a temper tantrum, as all the internet is in some cases now. But for those that have the skill and the desire to have a true debate, are you willing to sit down with somebody to talk about an issue that's important to you, whereas the potential outcome of that discussion is the fact that somebody may blow a hole in your argument and demonstrate to you that you may in fact be incorrect. That is a very risky proposition for the vast majority of people. And this is what my brother was talking about, that sometimes the argument becomes the point. I need to win the argument, not just because I want to win, but I have to protect the fact that I am indeed correct, right? For example, many things happen in the disaster and emergency management space. I post on LinkedIn probably three to five times a week. Uh, Two of those are intentionally, personally written, challenging, position challenging thoughts and ideas, right? Because I believe we need to push the paradigm. I have some pretty interesting views that are at the edges of where we are discussing right now. So they're at the paradynamic challenges and at the edges of the major discussions. And I put those ideas out there and some people disagree with me and I love it, right? For example, there's one gentleman, um, I've never met him in person, John Mitchell from uh, Australia, brilliant individual, been in emergency management longer than I think, um, that I was in the army. Like, I think the guy's got four decades already or something amazing like that in, uh, in emergency management. And obviously he has far more experience than I ever would. So we cross swords and we dance back and forth. And a couple of times I've said to him on LinkedIn, you're right. I didn't see it that way. I didn't understand it that way. I see what you mean now. How many people out there are correct or sorry, feel okay about saying that in an argument when looking at somebody going, you know what? Yeah, you're, you, you're indeed correct, right? You're indeed correct. Now I'm going to use the Trump analogy again because the U S election is coming up and everybody has an opinion on that human being. Okay. Are you willing to sit down irrespective of what side of the spectrum you're on? Because there's no neutrality on him. It's very much like our former uh, uh, Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the, the father of our current Prime Minister. Uh, when he was the Prime Minister, you either loved or hated him, but there was absolutely no human who was eh, apathetic about him. No, everybody loved him or hate him. You were either on one end of the spectrum. And I think Donald Trump fits that mantra now. Now, if you, irrespective of what side of the, the question you're on and your belief about the individual, are you willing to sit down with somebody who very well may persuade you that your position on him may be incorrect? It doesn't matter what side you're on, but are you willing to risk that? Or are you going to go in there and hammer away and just call the guy a flipping idiot, which is what we see online. People, when people challenge your point of view, when people challenge your position online, A lot of the times, I mean, you can block people when they're idiots and they act like idiots, but a lot of times people will block you, unfollow you, mute the conversation, whatever, because you're saying things that they disagree with and you're saying them in a powerful way that makes them feel uncomfortable. They don't like their belief system being challenged. They don't like what they've sunk cost fallacy, what they've thrown in tons of resources in. They don't like the stuff, you know, I've been wrong. And I say that before I've been wrong. For example, I had a certain viewpoint on emergency management in hospitals, right? Uh, I was, I worked in a hospital for two and a half years, uh, before I really, this is, you know, well over a decade ago, before I got into the field of, um, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, I worked in a hospital for two and a half years as a logistics and engineering guy. I was basically responsible for everything but the medical part of the hospital and uh, emergency management. I it was ridiculous. Didn't really matter. It was dumb. It was stupid, etc. cetera. Right. Um, I've met two. I've discoursed with two people online. Uh, one is runs Canada's number one emergency preparedness podcast. Uh, Grayson Crockett. Um, he's also been my canoe partner, but he has, really convinced me on a number of things that I was incorrect on about emergency management in hospitals. 
And I've admitted that to him, and I've admitted it online, and I'm admitting it again here, that things that I believe to be true turned out, in fact, to be inaccurate, and I'm happy and open and willing to admit that. I had a lot, I had a position that was incorrect and it needed to be corrected. Um, I disagree with people online now and I tell them that, you know, and the phrase that I love to use is this is the brilliance of open, intelligent discourse. You and I disagree on this point and I look forward to our next conversation, right? I just, I'm, I disagree with you. You disagree with me. Neither one of us have done a very good job of convincing the other person for a number of reasons, but it's polite and cordial. I don't block them. I don't unfollow them. Actually, I look forward to their next piece. And I don't make it a habit of going after people. Like you and I had a debate. Uh, we both agreed to disagree at the end of it, which I think is a fantastic conclusion. Um, and then the next time you post, I'm not going after you with two barrels to try to prove the fact that, look, Jeff's correct and you're not. And I'll give you an example of something really cool. So uh, my favorite course I've ever taken in academia, and I did 11 and a half years of university, um, was a fourth year psychology, half year class in the Royal Military College where I was doing my undergrad in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, it was called um, How to Win an Argument. It's kind of like, you know, How to Get Away with Murder, that TV show. It's, it was entitled, it had a different title and I forget that now. As, sorry, it was about, the title of the course was Persuasion and Influence and the subtitle was How to Win an Argument. I was talked by it was taught by Dr. Charbonneau, fantastic, brilliant individual, and she presented it in a mathematical format. Now, my math skills have long since waned <laughs> since those days. But if you think about a Venn diagram, right? So she basically said, "How to win an argument is this: first, you have to absolutely clearly understand the other person's argument before you're in a position to start taking it down." right? If somebody says something you disagree with, if you actually want to discourse and can, and, and win arguments and win debates, when I say argument, I mean winning a debate in a, in a professional manner. If somebody says something you disagree with, you don't launch on that because you don't understand why. So basically what she built this Venn diagram on is think of a table. The table is my argument. Underneath the table are four legs. These four legs are the four principal supporting ideas that allow the individual to hold the belief they do, right? Okay. It is my job in the first discourse as we go back and forth and we debate the topic at hand. I, in my mind, I'm developing that person's argument. I'm figuring out what their position is, which is sometimes a little bit more difficult than you would think. And then I'm looking for the four legs. I'm looking for the four principal ideas that hold up that person's argument, right? Once I identify all four and you need four, I then choose the weakest one. Which one has the greatest probability of being removed from the table? And then my iteration 10, 15 minutes into the debate starts to go after that leg. I'm looking at a leg that I can make the person at a minimum question their own position and argument in that leg. Now, if you think about it, a systematic way to win is what happens when I take two legs of a table away. The other two legs are strong and robust, but the table falls. The argument itself collapses because I was able to take away 50% of the supporting ideas that enable it, right? So for example, when somebody has a position and one of those strong legs is their religious ideology, you are not going to tell somebody that their religion is false. You are not going to attack the accuracy of the religious beliefs. You get nowhere. You're likely to infuriate people. And in, in a lot of professional scenes, th that's an insult, right? You don't go there. So if one of the four legs that holds up your argument is your religious ideology, I identify that and I set it to the side because I'm not going to try to persuade that your religious ideology is incorrect, flawed, or somehow, for example, I'm not going to come up to somebody who 
uh, is a Muslim and tell them that their understanding of the Holy Quran is incorrect. Right? What's the point? That's I'm attacking ideology. I'm not attacking the idea. Right? So what we do is we create those four legs in our mind. We find the weakest two and we systematically deconstruct the individual's argument. Now, if you look at the Venn diagram, if you think, and this it sounds a bit complicated, but it's not that when you take out a piece of paper and write it. Each argument is supported by four legs. Each leg is supported by four principal ideas, right? So if I look at a strong leg, if I look at the leg I want to target in the argument, one of the four pillars, that's go- that pillar itself is going to be based on four statements of truth that they have. And I, you get this by listening. This is why you have to learn and, and get the skill of listening. I now have four things to attack in a debate. And then I start systematically attacking those four things. And by attacking the four supporting statements of the person's belief, I'm not attacking the belief itself. I'm attacking the structure that allows the belief to exist. I know it sounds a little strange, but trust me, your argument, your position on a subject, your position on Donald Trump, your position on Elon Musk, your position on Justin Trudeau in Canada, your position on the Ukraine war, your position on China taking Taiwan, your position on emergency management's role in the fire department, any position you hold, I'm telling you, is the summation of 16 positive statements. That's what the course taught us. How to win an argument is built upon the idea that you deconstruct the person's argument down to its foundational 16 statements, four for each of the legs, find the two weakest legs, and to begin to systematically deconstruct those statements so they're no longer true in the person's mind. At minimum, when I have a debate, I define success as the person walks away less confident in their position less confident that their idea is indeed correct. Sometimes the, de- the debate and the discourse is about winning. Because remember, that's different from my need to be right. I've gone into a professional debate once against a gentleman. And I don't know if he listens to the podcast. He's in England or in Europe somewhere. An old classmate of mine from Royal Military College, uh, Malcolm Butler, a brilliant human being and an absolute expert about the Royal Canadian Navy, the British Royal Navy, Naval traditions and naval history. I made a one-line snippet remark in Curry Building in Otter Squadron in the basement of Curry Building. Um, and then he questioned me on it and I fired something stupid back at him and I got schooled for 10 minutes. You got to be careful because some people are actually very good at what they do. And Malcolm, God love him, wonderful human being, uh, totally schooled me on the Royal Navy being the senior service, why it's like that way, why their traditions matter, etc. And I had a poorly defined uh, off the cuff position on something and I said it out loud and I got schooled and I was absolutely wrong. And to this day, I never forget that because I use it as an example of why it's never good to always want to be right. Now you think about your online debates now. Now think about major issues and positions that you have. Things about uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk with other people, when you have discussions around the family table. You know, it's always a big thing in, in, um, in American politics and American, because America Thanksgiving is about politics because it's us- Americans go to a full election cycle uh, every two years. So every two years they reelect the entire Congress they reelect a third of the Senate every two years. And every four years, they reelect the president. So they are literally in campaign mode almost every Thanksgiving, or it's post the elections in November. And it's uh, a lot of ideas. And so they say, don't debate politics, abortion, or religion uh, around the table. Well, you know what? There's a lot of really difficult challenges in our world today that need to be debated, right? And absolutely, your ideas and positions are not wrong, but they may not be right. Or they may be based upon information that you believe to be correct, when in fact, you may be shown that it is incorrect, right? 
So some people believe certain things about personal responsibility. And this is something that I'll hammer on here for a couple of minutes. Um, it's I base the education system that we developed at Preparedness Labs Incorporated and the one that we use to support our ideas and our suggestions here on uh, Inside My Canoe Head is based upon the grounded fact that I believe that we have had a culture of dependency emerge in North America, especially less so in other parts of the world, but in North America, especially as a result of moving generations. I believe that that is based upon the fact that boomers and early Gen X had a culture of self-reliance. It doesn't mean that they were superhuman capable individuals. It just meant that their culture, they grew up in a world where it was probably up to you to figure out how to solve things and to find all the different possible solutions before you simply ask for help, right? Asking for help is the easy part. For some it is, but for some it's not. But so they did the work to figure out how to solve and address the issue they were finding with their friends, with their community, and then eventually might have to ask for help. As we transitioned from the boomers to Gen X to the millennials to now Gen Z uh, and the emerging Gen Alpha, you start to see a culture of dependency, which means individuals don't actually do anything for themselves. And I phrase that based upon the idea that we live in a modern technologically enabled connected society, right? So all of your support systems, now assuming you live in an urban area, which is 85% of the people in North America, if you live in an urban area, somebody else provides water and sewer, somebody else provides power, somebody else has set up a grocery store system, a pharmaceutical system, a transportation, and you see where I'm going with this. All of the systems that keep the city running and keep the world you integrate with running are done by somebody else. You don't do any of it. Like you're not, you don't build your own home. You don't grow your own food. Yes, I know some people do rural. I'm talking urban. You don't do anything to support yourself. What you do is you go out and you earn an income and you pay for those support services, right? So you got up every day without having to do anything required to have all of the systems around you run. That's a culture of dependency. Because what has happened as critical infrastructure or lifelines have become more and more prevalent in our lives, the skill sets that used to be necessary aren't practiced anymore. Lost to antiquity, you can call it whatever you want, but individuals now at Gen Alpha is less capable of self-reliant than a boomer. That's true. And I say it's directly correlated to the emergence of our modern technologically enabled society, where it's not that millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha are lazy. It's that they've never actually had to do anything to support themselves because the systems around them provided all of that support, which is why I've based our education system here at Preparedness Labs Incorporated on the idea of personal responsibility because the outsized expectations that are now placed on the governing systems of our society are just that, they're outsized. My argument to you, my position to you is the gap between what you think the government and society can do to help you is far bigger than what the government and society can actually do to help you. And it doesn't, it's not about money. It's not about more programs. It's not about more investments. It's that, that there is a huge gap between what you expect and want society to do to take care of you and what it actually can that gap needs to be filled by moving the pendulum back more towards the Gen X boomer generation, the idea of self-reliance in that you don't turn every bump in the night. Now somebody turns to the government for a program. We have a problem in society. You know, we have somebody doing this. We have this crisis or that crisis. Oh, we must need a government program. We must need government intervention. Whereas the Gen X boomer generation was, what can my friends and family and my colleagues do to help me? What can my community do to help me? When I've exhausted all of that, then maybe, yeah, in exceptional cases, a government program may be the answer. We've changed around now. So I base the entire strategy here on that, right? So you can see how my argument going back to what I said before about personal responsibility is based upon four pillars and 16 statements. So if you wanted to challenge 
my idea about personal responsibility. You may decide to say, hey, I don't think Gen Alpha is less capable in skill sets. And I'm going to argue with you that they're not. You see how you start chipping away at the argument that I present. So we built that uh, our education system based upon personal responsibility and said, okay, realistically, people are not going to go into yurts and they're not going to go buy five acres in northern New Brunswick, uh, put a yurt down, get a wood stove, start growing their own food, dig an outhouse, get a solar panel, a couple of solar panels, uh, a Yeti or a Jackery power system, and uh, off they go, right? And they'll get a Starlink to throw up on the roof and they'll live large. People aren't going to do that. So, and nor should, nor do we recommend they should, but there's something in the middle there. And, and I think I know where that is and I'm still working on that. But the idea behind it is, is that we able to debate that. We're able to discuss that. We're able to think where you and I probably may agree or disagree on where we think that line of intervention from government should be and where it should be personal responsibility right? One example that I like to use when people want to discuss this issue is uh, I talk about one of our trifecta of preparedness plans is having a plan for when you're fired, right? Because everybody leaves their job at one point. You'll either die, retire, quit, or you'll get fired, right? So you will lose the job you're in right now at some point. Hopefully it's at a time of your choosing. But what if it's not? I argue it is your responsibility right now to have a robust and fully funded plan to be able to pivot to another line of income as soon as you get fired. That's my argument. That's my position. I believe you should have that plan, right? Do I think I'm right? Yes, I believe that I am correct because the pandemic showed us that income support programs by the government are possible in the short term. In the long term, income support programs by the government raised massive inflation that caused a jug effery, if you want to go down that road, of problems in the economy. Okay? So it's not realistic to expect every, because remember, the government doesn't have any money, right? The government doesn't create money. It, it, the money comes from people or it's borrowed from our grandchildren. So when you're not prepared to be fired and immediately pivot to another line of income or have savings to cover the gap while you pivot to the other line of income, you're saying it is everybody else's income. We need to take money from everybody else's income so that there's a, so, so, so the government's ready to pay me money because it's everybody else who has to pay my bills when I get fired. That's a bit of a strong argument, but I put that out there and I put that out there repeatedly that it is not my responsibility to pay for everybody else's bills in the long run. I said long run. Short-term disruption coverage is absolutely necessary. It's part of our social safety net and should be there, but not long-term. Now, that's a basis for a discussion. Do I need to be right? Do I have an inherent belief that I am? I do believe I'm correct, but I have been shown to be incorrect in the past. I have lost arguments in the past, and I likely will continue to lose arguments in the future because I'm not perfect. I don't know everything about everything. I know everything about a very small niche area, which is just a default reduction of, of the studies that I've done. Uh, in, when I mean a very niche area, income. I'm talking about if you want to talk about emergency preparedness communications from local governments to the population, I would argue you're going to have a difficulty finding another human being that can argue better. And I just say that because I spent seven years studying that one simple single issue on its own, right? That's a very, very niche. Now, I have a lot of other thoughts about emergency management writ large, bigger, et cetera, but in this very, very tiny niche area, happy days. But the point is, are we trying to win an argument? Are we trying to be right? Now, to wrap it back up to what we were talking about at the beginning, 
The article that I talked about that's in Psychology Today talked about it being a spectrum. There's a host of ideas because people want to be seen as intelligent. Uh, They want to be seen as correct. They want to have a position in an imaginary hierarchy. And they believe themselves, right? They, They believe themselves to be true. And when you create an echo chamber, which means you create a space online or in, or in person where you surround yourself by only people who have the same views as you, that will continually reinforce the idea that you are indeed correct. And it is the other people who are indeed. And we vilify them. And everybody, <clears throat> well, not everybody, but some people enjoy watching Charlie Kirk out of the U.S. have his debates with college students, etc., right? And he's debating people on ideas. He's got a set of ideas uh, and he uses a methodology to debate people to say, hey, listen, you know what? You may not be right. I'm right. This is why I'm right. And he gives stats and he gives statistics. I've learned over time in in research that uh, if you believe monkeys can turn into frogs, I probably can find you a peer-reviewed research article that would argue that the possibility of that is not zero. Evidence exists in singular formats to support ideas. We've talked about conspiracy theories before. People have conspiracy theories about a lot of things. Uh, Those generally emerge because of a lack and a gap of information. So, When an event happens and the government has no comment and they don't insert the truth into the discourse and you leave an open space, people will feel free to use that space. If you're not going to tell me what's going on, it's because you must be hiding something. And I think you're hiding this. You see how that runway starts. But if the government comes out and says, this is what happened, this is exactly what's going on, this is exactly what happened, it defeats the, it removes the oxygen from conspiracy theories other than those small tinfoil hat people who just out of the blue absolutely think that there's no doubt there's a conspiracy theory in everything. But conspiracy theories exist when the truth is absent from the conversation by a position who should know the truth. And we don't do a very good job of arguing that. Now, The last part I want to cover before we wrap today's 299th episode up is the idea around censorship. Now, it's important because it's about needing to be right. And I talked about people who compartmentalize their discussion into areas of confirmation bias and where they create echo chambers and they only hear what they want to hear. People believe to some degree that a social media platform should be regulated. That somebody should ensure that only the truth is found on the internet. And that different positions can exist, but when somebody spews misinformation, and those of you who get confused, misinformation is the intentional spreading of information that you believe to be true, but it is in fact untrue and you were not aware that it's untrue. Disinformation is the intentional spreading of information that you believed that you know is false, but you still spread it anyhow. So those are different. But people believe there should be some level of control over mis and disinformation on the internet. That somebody at some place, whether it be government or the social media platform itself or some independent agency, should be able to go in and remove information that is deemed to be inaccurate, unhelpful, inflammatory, or otherwise not truthful. The challenge that I have for people is I have yet to find in all of my 53 years on this earth I have yet to find a single human being who has the skill set to be the arbiter of truth. The arbiter of truth is the individual or agency that you give the power to determine what is and is not good for you to see. 
And that individual will span out across the internet or agency, and it will remove everything that is not helpful or good to you so that you only see things that are good or useful. That has a very overlord Orwellian idea behind it. I have, I'm not saying that mis and disinformation are, are good. I'm saying I don't know of any single agency, organization that has the skill set, knowledge, and ability, and the independence and lack of bias who could fulfill the role of the arbiter of the truth. So because of that, I don't believe there should be censorship on the internet beyond what is legally framed in a country's law. So for Canada, for example, we have something called hate speech. It's defined in the law. In the United States of America, they don't have hate speech. It is not something that exists in the United States of America. So something that may be removed from the internet in Canada because it's hate speech is perfectly fine in the U.S. because they don't have something called hate speech. Remember, I'm not asking whether you believe hate speech is real or whether it should exist or be regulated. I'm saying from a legal definition, it doesn't exist in certain countries in the world. Therefore, hate speech does not exist, right? Now, it can be offensive if something is slanderous, if something is libelous, if something is inciting violence, if something is talking about the exploitation of children. Those things are codified in law. And therefore, my argument is they should be removed from the Internet at first sight because it's codified in the law. Again, I offer that as saying I don't think that censorship is bad. I just haven't found somebody who has the ability, the skill set and the lack of bias from an individual or an organization has the ability to do that on a neutral basis. I don't I've never I don't know of anything that could do that. And because of that. If we allow somebody to do that, bias will intervene and one point of view will be suppressed and we will create an echo chamber on the internet of only things that we agree with, which is the definition of lack of freedom of speech. So what we wanted to do today in this 299th episode is to talk about our need to be right, talk about where it may be grounded talk about why it may get us into trouble and talk about why we as individuals, especially those like me and similar to me who are open to discourse, who are happy to sit down with people we disagree with to talk about important issues of the day from the position of understanding that we very well may be incorrect. And I'm happy to admit that I am incorrect. Happy. When I've been shown to be incorrect, I'm perfectly happy to admit it. Without question, I'm not sure everybody else can do that. I'm not sure that we have the right people doing that in times of difficulty and challenges in our society, especially when today we are faced with some pretty extreme and important discussions that we need to have as a society. And I'm not sure we're really capable of having those. So hopefully you enjoyed the episode today. Hopefully it was a good little step off. We are coming up later this week with episode number 300 from Inside My Canoe Head. And there'll be a lot of thank yous. There'll be a lot of pats on the back. There'll be a lot of thumbs up to a lot of really important people who made this podcast get to where it is on our journey But I just want to end today's episode with a big thank you to people that have been here from the beginning. There's a handful of individuals who subscribe to my newsletter uh, and have been following my journey for a number of years, uh, including they've now made the jump over to Substack. Now, we've moved all of our written published material uh, going forward over to Substack. So if you go to Substack and you look for at preparedness labs, or my name, Jeff Donaldson. If you look at that, you're going to find our Substack. Subscribe to it. It's where we'll be putting out our written word, our written argument. And I chose Substack because right below it is a comment open to anybody. So this is my ability to get into that debate and discussion with anybody who holds a viewpoint counter to what I have. 
you now have an open forum to be able to debate with me. I think that's important. I think we need to do more of this. And so Substack was the easy decision to move our stuff over to. So if you were a previous subscriber to the newsletter, it just won't happen anymore. We thank you for all of your support, but we're going to put out two to three publications a week on Substack that are challenging, that are paradynamic punching, and are going to be there to generate debate and discourse. And hopefully you will engage Subscribe and follow. Listen, the Substack is our written word. The podcast is our verbal word. Both of those are free. They always will be free. The information is there because this is our community service to you and everybody else around to raise the specter of preparedness, to get people to start thinking about personal responsibility and to help people navigate this spicy decade of the 2020s. And it's only going to get much more interesting. So thanks again for all of your listening. Thanks again for your dedication to this podcast. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>